fights for his rights it's called legitimate but when a woman fights for her rights it's always called feminism so but uh, uh, during the course of my talk i will be forced to use this word because i have no other choice and uh, let me begin with the notions we have in religion in hinduism we have brahma the creator vishnu the preserver shiva the destroyer all of them are in the form of a man in christianity god sent his son to the earth and not his daughter and islam we have 125000 prophets i repeat 125000 prophets and not even one among them is a woman well this is just one side of the picture and it's a matter of perspective now let us look at the other side in hinduism it is said the mother and motherland are greater than hell and ramayana is taken to be a patriarchal text okay but when we when we look at it from a different perspective ram was sent into exile on the dictates of a woman this whole war was fought for one woman and the whole kingdom went into quandary over the chastity of one woman and if jesus christ was born of a miracle why was not at least this privilege attributed to a man and in islam it says that heaven lies at the feet of mothers and also significantly once when a man came to the prophet and asked him um who do you value the most or who should i value the most the prophet said first your mother and second he said again your mother third again he said your mother and uh, that should, and only fourth was the father mentioned and in islam though slightly you know if there is a bias towards a husband being superior to the wife there is only a one to one correspondence between a husband and a wife but there is a one to many correspondence between a mother and her children so this shows how how uh, we we need to look at things from a different perspective and also uh, coming to semitic religions there is always the idea of a woman having the second place because she is uh, supposedly uh, uh, constructed from the ribs of man and man came first and uh, this is why you know as the reader said where historical priority is confused with conceptual priority and i i like to know the response of the audience how many of you think that uh, do you think woman was created first or woman was created second Okay. I would like to look at the responses. Please. Is the priority important? The chat box. No, that 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 is what I am asking. Uh, how many of you think uh, I could could I get your responses in the chat box? Um, Doctor Rukia, I am I am Umar. Yes, sir. Uh, what, hello, sir. Yeah, hello. I I I don't know whether women were created first or men were created first, but I think it doesn't matter who was created first, because it doesn't mean that you know one is superior because he or she was created first and the other one was created later. That is That's what I'm coming point. to. Yeah. Okay. Right. I was just coming uh, to that. I just wanted to know the responses of the students yeah, particularly. Yeah. 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 I see that we have a very responsive audience. There are no responses in the chat box, or is it that I? Um, Doctor Dukhe, I'm a faculty here. Hello. Ah, uh, there you are. Hello, how are you, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, hi, Rukia. Uh, no, I just wanted to say I have a feeling the students have not really understood the question. I have a feeling that's why they are silent. Do you think uh, you could, uh, Asha? I have a feeling they have not uh, really got it. So, uh, Rukia, I think you could just repeat it and ask. Uh, then they may might. This is my hunch. I'm not sure. I have a feeling they have not really. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Okay, okay ma'am, I'll do that. Now my question is: Since according to Semitic religions, it is generally believed that uh, man was created first and woman was created second. And uh, 
uh, because this, you know, some, because some people confuse historical priority with conceptual priority, like the reader said in the case of phonocentrism. Now, my question to students was, what is your perception? Do you think man was created first or woman was created first? This was my just a type first or second. Do you think woman was created first or second? Uh, Ma'am, if we go by logic, it should be women first. I could have your responses in the chat box also. Megha says women is created first. Okay. Students, please respond in the chat box. You don't have to talk. You just write. She's asking a question to you all. Women first. Asha says women first. Okay. Amrita says women was created first. Noor Jahan is saying. And there, there are no responses from boys or are, are, are our boys an endangered species, just like in our PG classrooms. Uh, very, we have very few boys actually. Okay, sir. There are just three around, I think. Two. Man first. Okay. Okay, I'm not uh, wasting time any further. Uh, I also believe that women were created not first, but second. Yes, women were created second. Because uh, the second creation will always be, the, be better than the first. Nobody creates something worse than they have already created. So just like we have our updated mobile phones and all. So and to God even to think so would be blasphemy. So uh, definitely woman was created in second. And I agree with that. So uh, Neetu Jolly says just like the chicken and the egg question. So the second creation will always be better than the first. Okay. And uh, that was one the first part of good religion. And uh, we normally have a woman is very much instrumental also in the success of a man. We say that behind every successful man, there is a woman. Behind every unsuccessful man, there are two women. And uh, there was an uh, incident where the BBC journalist went to interview a woman in Afghanistan. There's a practice there that the woman walks nine steps behind the man in Afghanistan. And a BBC journalist went and asked her, uh, she found it a kind of regressive practice. And she went and asked her why. And the late, this was the answer that a lady gave her, landmines. Because, uh, you know, if the landmine explodes, it is a man who will explode first. And the woman will be safe. So behind every man, there's an intelligent woman also. And uh, one thing that, a uh, question that has always uh, come to my mind on a serious notice, if a woman considers herself equal to a man, why do we have reservations? And why do women claim to reservations? So I'd like to mention three incidents in this slide. Uh, I hope all of you are aware of an actress called Zaira Wasi. She was uh, trolled incessantly in, Jan in December 2017 when she claimed in a video on her Instagram uh, handle that she was molested on a Vistara flight from Delhi to Mumbai. And she accused of a co-passenger of uh, constantly rubbing her uh, against her with, her with his feet as she tried to sleep. And she saw that the airline staff were of no help. Just as she was an actress, intellectual claimed it to be a publicity stunt. And she had requested to change her seat and the staff simply refused. And instead, she was asked by the public why she had made the video instead of reaching out for help. So the fact that she had reached out to help was relegated. And this was added to the list of stunts that she wanted to do to gain publicity. And the, she had no need for that, actually. This super talented actress had just appeared then in just one more film called The Sky is Pink uh, to end an unbelievable series of movies that included Dangal, that emerged as the highest grossing movie. And uh, it crossed some 2,000 crore worldwide. And she also won a national award for the best supporting actress. And also the movie Secret Superstar was the highest grossing Indian movie with the female protagonist. And she won the Film Critics Award for that. And uh, instead of trolling her, uh, people could not understand what, why she needed to do this as a publicity stunt. And finally, 
after three years, in January 2020, the court finally convicted the accused Vikas Sachdeva guilty. He has been sentenced to three years imprisonment under Section 8 of POSCO and Section 354 of IPC. And, you know, under, in the Me Too moment, you know, all the allegations leveled against the Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. And finally, Harvey Weinstein was found guilty in January 2020. It took 90 women, 90 women, to accuse him of harassment, rape, the Me Too movement, five years of court proceedings, and intervention from the New York State governor to finally achieve this. And this is how hard the justice, the fight for justice is for women. And coming to a personal example, I joined Nehru College in 2012. And uh, it is an aided college. And when I had gone to see the manager, uh, I gave him my CV, but he refused to look at it. I had a decent CV, but he, we have only PG English there. We do not have uh, B English main, we have only PG. And he kept on telling me without looking at my CV, uh, teacher a PG and a nalla level vanam, high level language vanam. we were speaking in Malayalam and he kept on telling me that you this is a PG English class nalla level I, I was just wondering why he did not look at my CV or anything and he kept on staying that high level vanam, high level vanam. and uh, uh, because one thing I understood was it was because I was a woman and a Muslim woman and a Muslim woman from Kasargur intersectionality and um, I started teaching in Nehru College and after six months, uh, we, they took the feedback from the students. And there was only one complaint, level is too high. So it took uh, Zaira Vasim three years, Harvey Weinstein, 90 women, and me six months to prove that I taught my students language and their profit on this they know how to curse. And since then, I have stopped asking myself why women need reservations, because the race is definitely not the same. Now, we go to, even if we go to systems of, uh, we think quite often women are we reified, objectified. It is true. But if we view this in a larger perspective, we find that even men are fired. We have a female infanticide because, and, and because lady women, perhaps girls are considered as a dead investment and brother boys are considered as a better investment. So in that case, they are also reified and they are objectified. And we are the greatest system in India where men are actually reified and objectified, the system of dowry. Uh, it is like an auction and the higher bid, highest bidder gets the goods. And so we can see that uh, if, if, when you view things in a different perspective, uh, we get to see things differently. And we know uh, yesterday also we have we heard about the heartrending rape of the Hathras victim. Uh, and the Dalit girl's fight is not definitely the same. Where if it's a celebrity, she gets instant response. And again, uh, it's not definitely the same. And in the case of Nirbhaya, even when she was raped, that was the thing that uh, made a sensational issue. And even when Nirbhaya was raped, uh, there were certain questions asked. They were uh, asking what was she doing at that time with a boyfriend and uh, the time when she was out, the fact that she was a boyfriend, the dress she was wearing. All these questions seemed to matter than what actually happened to Nirbhaya. But again, but the very next day when a four-year-old is raped, all these questions become meaningless. Do you question her dress? No. You Do you question what time she was out? No. Whether she was a boyfriend? So these, uh, what do you say, to, uh, these kind of toxic questions need to be addressed and these kind of toxic thinking. And even when the Nirbhaya incident happened, one of the boys was just six months short of 18 years. And uh, on these grounds, even the, the, there was at one point, it was believed that he would be let off. So, so in India, we have a system, as someone said, where you can marry, uh, you cannot marry before 18, but you can rape before 18. So this is the first part of my uh, talk. And the second, the second part, I go to the theory part of it. Uh, with your permission, sir, could I screen share? You can, you can press it there. Yeah, I can I, okay, you can sir. press it there, right?
I hope my screen is visible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My window. Visible. Okay, thank visible. you. Visible. Uh, just visible. So uh, I thought in this part of my lecture, I'll talk about the theory part of the way uh, kinds of post-feminism. There is a general tendency to confuse post-feminism with third wave feminism. It's not essentially the same. And just we'll have a brief look at the first wave and second wave. You know that this is a you're familiar with this that the first wave had to do with the 19th and early 20th century and it dealt with suffrage, political rights, and property rights, etc. etc. The second wave feminism of the 1960s and 80s focused on issues of equality and discrimination. The personal is political. The identified women's uh, that was a signature slogan during those times. The personal is political and political is personal. And it identified women's cultural and political inequalities and how their personal lives reflect sexist power structures. Now, the problem with uh, the second wave feminism was that you know, they tried to create this of uh, this concept of woman as a common denominator or a unified subject, and same thing that it, it had initially set out to contest. And I'll also explain third wave feminism mainly by focusing on the differences. There's a general conception that these are the same, but no, these are different. Third wave is actually a continuation of the second wave, but it is tinged with uh, activism on political pro protest. If the second wave were the mothers, the third wave were the daughters, and these people are colored more by political protest and activist movements, and they distinguish, they also make it a point to distinguish from their alienated post feminist sisters. There were 30, the, particularly third rate pioneers like Rebecca Walker and Shannon Liss who were very clear that we are not post-feminist feminists, we are the third wave. And the third wave also, it acknowledges these differences in the various identities. It uh, works with the fragmentation of existing identities and institutions. It acknowledges these differences, but at the same time, it while it acknowledges these identities, it tries to break free identity politics and while it does though, that has not resulted in political apathy also. Rather, it is political and at the same time, it were great free of identity politics. On this other hand, post-feminism treats these differences as constructions. It does not recognize these differences itself, but just like in the post-structuralist mode, it treats these uh, different various differences and fragmentations all as constructions. And while uh, the third wave recognizes the, these differences and try to do away with identity politics, it is also it recognizes the diversity and the complexity and ambiguity of the world. And uh, both the second and the third waves of feminism, they are united in their condemnation of post-feminism related to popular culture. Uh, post-feminism is essentially related to popular culture and it is uh, uh, ruled by market principles and mainstream media. And while third wave was seen by critics to be a more scholarly category, post-feminism related to popular culture. Now, this is a category that comes under post-feminism. It is called new traditionalism or austerity, austerity nostalgia. There was a, somehow um, men uh, have an uh, impression that uh, Women while sitting at a ho at home have nothing uh, significant to do. I don't know. I'm not speaking for all men, but some men. There is a kind of patriarchal thought. Uh, I think generally, even some women. You know, see, we see normally she's so educated and she's sitting at home. When we say she's sitting at home, we try to ma make it a kind of idle act. And uh, also, you know, uh, even my husband used to, at one point used to come and ask me, "What did you do all this time?" And there was an anecdote about a man okay one day he comes back from office at six o'clock and uh, he sees the front yard strewn with he does not see his uh, neat wife with a cup of tea and he goes to the kitchen the whole house is messy the kitchen is true uh, loitered with dishes and when he goes to his messy bedroom again he finds his wife idly reading a book and he asks what the hell so she asks do you remember used to always ask me what I did till this time, well, today I didn't do it. So that is what new traditionalism, austerity, nostalgia is all about. 
the new traditional or retreated sorry retreatist discourse it centralizes or idealizes women's apparently fully knowledgeable choice to abstain from paid work in favor of birth and family it gives an impression that she herself is making uh, the decision to abstain from paid work so she can be away from the toil and stress of working life in favor of birth and family and this version of home as a women sanctuary from the stresses of working life is articulated the domestic domain it is rebranded as a domain of a female autonomy and independence where women get to make their own decisions so women are again they retreat to this side of new traditionalism or austerity and nostalgia and all the, we we go to the recession all the you so you know all policy decisions were made and but the effects are never gendered the effects are never gendered the effects always seem to be uh yeah, some, sometimes even all kind of devastating effects are said to be female so in the case of you you have all kinds of uh, natural disasters named after women uh, you have hurricane rita hurricane katrina hurricane tsunami uh You never find. Have you ever found a natural disaster named after a man? I have, and uh, and uh, so, and not only that is a kind of language. Even while addressing uh, these phenomena, uh, the uh, tempest was found to be flirting. It had a temperamental nature. It was flirting with the coastline, etc. And uh, there was a Florida feminist. I forgot her name. Uh, even in her obit she fought against this tendency of naming natural disasters after women even in her obituary it was written that uh, you know, the she was a tempestuous florida feminist and that is any of it i come back to this sorry according to susan falgudi in her backlash the undeclared war against women the back to home movement has to be recognized as a creation of the advertising industry and turn a recycled version of the victorian fantasy advocating a new new cult of domesticity so this was nothing but a recycling of the victorian women's question uh, during the industrial when the industrial revolution happened women also started going out to work and when they started demanding equal pay uh, it was questioned uh, and uh, men they try to re- push them back into the private sphere saying that uh, the public sphere would were sully their virtue and so they had to remain in the private sphere and it is this kind of recycling of the victorian question that we find here and as i told you earlier the during times of policy decision making do there are things like you know we have the when during this covid crisis or during the recession of 2008 though these effects are never gendered but women is supposed to find the solution to that they are supposed to Uh, provide uh, as men come back from work they are supposed to provide an austere atmosphere to men and then we have uh, this concept of power feminism versus victim feminism natasha walters book the new feminism focused on power feminism versus victim feminism and there were other critics also like naomi wolf kt roif and renee denfield who also discussed the discussion between victim feminism and power feminism Power feminism actually means identifying with other women through shared pleasures and strength. Unlike victim feminism that shared it through vulnerability and pain. And Rolfe dubbed second feminism as a new Victorianism because she felt that it actually advocates sexual morality by advocating the vision of an ideal woman as sexually pure, and she is helpless. and it's how this lady by being the lady the woman by being sexually pure and helpless is somehow morally superior to men and in power feminism the woman is unapologetic so the 1990s it saw an explosion of new types of feminism there was corporate feminism there was doomy feminism branch feminism and perhaps the most famous girl power to come to all this corporate feminism highlights the new ideas of autonomy choice and meritocratic advancement and the poster child of this movement was sheryl strandberg the face of executive and uh, she uh, advocated this neoliberal position and it 
this is a deeply individualistic type of feminism that has been informed by market principles and her best selling book lean in women and the will to lead shows how women how to succeed while crafting a work family balance and this also has come in for criticism because it was argued that especially feminists like angela mercrobi she said that sandberg's address was exclusively to a privileged white middle class sector of the population and it not, it did not include the world of non elite labor it ignored the high cost of child care and the reliance of all these white class white middle class women on uh, low paid domestic labor of the migrant women and uh, because of this the, the term corporate feminism has also acquired some negative connotations and it is shown to go to to the system instead of questioning it and because of this some people also equate hillary clinton with corporate feminism because uh, in spite of all her claims of championing the causes of lgbt community and women's right she was known to have cheerleaded cheerleaded many policies that i have actually proved to be devastating for these groups and then we come to that uh, movement the girl power and chiclet and this is essentially a movement that was aimed at a young generation of women and girls it was propagated in the 1990s it was pervasive in media definitions of post feminism and this particular group its defining feature is a reappraisal of femininity while second wave feminism found some aspects of femininity to be uh, disempowering and oppressive they made use of the same features and tried and they said that uh, it only empowers them so they use the stereotypical symbols of the feminine enculturation such as like the barbie dolls makeup and fashion magazines and on hot pants you know, they, the very they took up these aspects of femininity and made it to their strength instead of you uh, treating them as uh, disempowering so they had on hot pants wonder bras and platform shoes as you can see this is a spice girls who were you know the poster girls for this movement and they and uh, they used and instead what they did was they took these features of fappy essentialist or disempowering or and formulated by men they took these very features and made it to be uh, cultural markers or subversive for example the color pink in the indian context we have uh, pink the movie pink uh, where the pink is used as a symbol of choice in the movie uh, featuring amitabh bachchan and tapasi pannu it is a very interesting uh, movie where three i don't know if you have watched the movie uh, of the girl, you know three guys so the whole argument is pre premised on the idea that the the boys say the, the, there are there is some kind of abuse of these girls by the boys they keep on arguing that these girls had given they had taken money from them and that's why they went along with them but this end up but there nothing of that kind happened and in the court room this argument is constantly made and finally the girl uh, she says that yes she agrees yes i did take money but at the last moment i said no so that kind of the idea of choice is very much highlighted there by the color of pink it is made into a subversive marker the kind of she says though she hadn't taken money she said even if i take money i have the choice to give it back even a prostitute has the uh, freedom to choose her customers so that idea of choice is used as a subversive marker in the movie pink and uh, synonymous with chiclet uh, yeah it has become synonymous with another uh, fiction that emerged during those times called the chiclet it was a female oriented fiction that it celebrated the female ad pleasures of female adornment and heterosexual romance and now the negative uh, criticism against this movement was that it was an objectifying trap again you know it uh, made women to buy into patriarchal stereotypes of feminine principles and market principles and the woman is flaunting her emancipated status through consumption in the indian context you have this movie veer the wedding it is called a chick flick uh, you have um, swara baskar karina kapoor and uh, sonam kapoor uh, playing the lead and in this also you see they use these uh, pink uh, as a 
marker of femininity but surprisingly the uh, these uh, producers of this movie refuse uh, though it is a chick flick they refuse to this uh, label of chick flick and say this is not a chick flick because it is more or less in that genre the positive criticism against uh, in this line is it has the potential to uproot femininity and make it available for alternate meanings and readings feminism need not always be anti feminine anti popular as people think so and as i said earlier it makes a subuse of subversive use of cultural signs the refashioning of feminine identities and the spice girls were the poster girls of this movement it set the stage for a number of girl bands like the dead child little mix and fifth harmony and another mode we have uh, in the post feminism is the doomy feminism it is a highly sexualized version of power feminism in response to the late 1970s anti pornography movement and it has been synonymous with the work of andrew dokin and katherine macmillan and in this sexual sexual freedom and sexuality are seen to be a key uh to female independence and their emancipated status so i'll give you an example from the indian context again the dirty picture vidya balan's dirty picture uh it was based on the life of the late silk smita and uh, silk smita is and that is why they have put out this name of the dirty picture an ironic title and it, but they say that this has to be seen in a larger perspective because uh Silk Smita worked in the 1980s when the film industry was dominated was male dominated and in such a sense a woman using her sexuality as a weapon made a name for herself and uh, the she, producers also say that this is not only about Silk Smita it is also about disco shanti it is also about Marilyn Monroe so we know what they are driving at so this kind of sexual revolution it was advocated by cultural theorists like Camille Palia who in her sexual persona states that we need to recall the sexual revolution the criticism against this movement was again that this pornographic material it was defamatory to women and they were again objectified or reified and uh, uh, it was it uh, portrayed misogyny in its most extreme form and that is why there was robin morgan's famous slogan porn is a theory rape is a practice and shulamit firestone also in uh, 2003 in her dialectic of sex she said that this kind of sexual revolution it brought about no improvement for women and an extreme uh, version of doomy feminism is raunch feminism it is an extra degree higher and the well that had some where it was equated to sexual objectification this was equated with sexual subjectification subjectivation sorry and uh, uh, fiona atwood in sex stuff theorizing the sexualization of culture she says that in this particular mode sexual values public shift to more permissive sexual attitudes the proliferation proliferation of sexual texts and the emergence of new form of sexual experiences was a hallmark of this particular uh, mode of feminism and uh, i'll give you another example no the example is given by ari ariel levin herself in her female shavnis pick she cites the example of uh, the miss america 1983 vanessa williams she was stripped of a crown because her photos suddenly appeared her nude photos had suddenly appeared in the penthouse and because of this uh, she had to give up her crown and then with a lot of hard work she had to reestablish herself after some time as a singer and an, as an actress and on another side we had uh, paris hilton the heiress to the hilton group of hotels and uh, she in i think it was in 2003 she had released uh, it was i can i cannot say that she released a sex video of her and her boyfriend was released into the internet it became viral and uh, she gained instant celebrity hood from it and that is why in 2003 her uh, reality show i think it was named the simple life yes the simple life it gained gave her, gave her instant celebrity hood she became instantly famous so in female shavnis pig ariel levy she says that while earlier on one had to actually come back from porn now porn itself was a comeback
so and uh, uh, rosalind gill argues that nowadays women have undergone a shift from sexual objectification to sexual subject subjectification and they are presented as active desiring sexual subjects who, who are okay with it and they present themselves in a seemingly objectified manners because it suits them to do so and uh, again the criticism against this is that what is actually the notion of the sexual new sexual subjecthood is or what some people call the new feminism is actually the old objectification then we come to the next idea called liberal sexism uh this is very much in vogue we think we have progressed so much uh, that sexism no longer exists okay we think it is past uh, and uh, post feminism gives uh, passe sorry and post feminism gives white the permission to discount sexism uh i have seen the most educated of my professors i am now taking any names saying that a man can uh, only men can think structuredly and women cannot think uh, cannot think in a structured manner uh, who say that intelligent woman is an oxymoron and uh, the f- funny thing is we are supposed to love these uh, professors our husbands who make all these kind of discounted kind of sexism sexist comments uh, bell hooks had said uh, sexism is the only form of oppression where the oppressed is supposed to love their oppressor and we turn a blind eye to the such sex structural inequity inequities landline gender prejudices and we find these kind of sexual micropolitics in all kind of statements when um, sunil gavaskar makes the statement that uh, virat kohli is uh, is in bad form because of his wife and recently we saw a kind of sex extremism what was sex extremism was actually uh, on the part of uh, bjp nayak we you know uh, the issue that has been go- going on on uh, because of uh, three ladies since they did not get justice the, the, the man was apparently making all kind of lewd comments on his youtube videos and uh, he was the one who was actually uh, resorting to sex extremism but eventually it was said that these women man handled these three man handled these men and uh, they were accused of eventually of sex extremism and uh, if 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 it was a man who had uh, man handled uh, this man if it was two or three men it would have been a different story they, they would have been heralded as a very epitome of masculinity nalladayirunu but uh, since it's women and again it is called as sex extremism in what is extremism in the on the part of vijay p nair in this term, it is you know the label has gone down to the women so in In this particular kind of liberal sexism also find the cross nurturing ideologies of post feminism and neo liberalism liberalism and they are found to be working hand in hand in this dismissal of sexism and in this also you know we are interpolate like althusa had said we are interpolated with this ideology ideology that women are autonomous entrepreneurs and savvy consumers who actually self brand or objectify themselves as a means of getting ahead and in this case also psychologists they make a difference between hostile and benevolent sexism you know where in the first the carrot is uh, aimed at enticing women to enact traditional roles by in the former the stick is used to punish them that is a difference they make as hostile sexism and benevolent sexism then we come to the next mode called postmodern feminism because of construction of this difference itself and this constitute nature of the individual and it stresses a, as a um, reaction to the second wave that's this object oppression of this women has been legitimated through modern theory and its essentialism foundationalism and universalism and the criticism against this is that people generally look at a postmodernism with suspicion as feminism is subsumed into the postmodernist critique of the tyranny of the signifier and you know that in the postmod in postmodernism the you, the subject is not uh, natural it is constructed it is not unified but it is uh, considered to be a discursive construct and it is not a uh, stable but it is fluid so this is the hallmark of postmodern feminism a prominent example for postmodern feminism would be madonna uh, she is considered as the archetypal postmodernist post feminist woman reworking her identity 
in an interview with uh, truta de she said you can never access the real madonna she keeps on changing herself she keeps on reinventing herself and she uses simulation her videos to strategic stra strategically change the stable notion of gender and you can find her hyper feminine and hyper sexualized uh, performances in her music videos and movies and you can see that her gote bustia in her 1990 brand ambition to she through wearing this kind of dress she tries to bear the devices of femininity and she shows that feminine is actually it is a device and it can be put on and it is that yeah, that it is constructed and then you in material girl also the song material girl madonna she again she replaces the iconic femininity of merlin monro through the act she puts on the uh, act and dress of merlin monro and again she tries to show that femininity is actually a device and in fact it is constructed next i come on to post colonial feminism okay the difference uh, post colonial feminism is actually an offshoot of post feminism and it is also a reaction against it it calls for diversification and a non ethnocentric and non heterosexist feminism that is it why it it understands the fact that post feminism was initially directed only at white upper middle class women and it wants to actually deconstruct the unified subject also as postulated by modernism it found racial class and ethnic oppressions at the bottom of women's marginalization the all these categories were relegated found out in the popular representations of post feminism and it wanted to highlight these factors but again it treats gender and difference also while these women the difference is that uh, between post colonial feminism and third wave was that while these uh, different they wanted to highlight the marginalized also they also try to show these marginalizations were only constructions that is the difference between post colonial feminism and third wave third wave feminism tried to break free of identity politics while recognizing the differences but these they say that these dis differences do not exist they are basically constructs so post feminism it offers possibilities for women of culture color to re-signify white middle class western feminism and white post feminism also it elevated the traditional center of male pale and yale over the periphery of black and female so till now there was only male pale and yale uh, as the center in post feminism so uh, at a certain juncture in post feminism this uh, movement emerged it was a reaction against and again it was also a part of post feminism and this for the particular other people mainly behind quite clearly were the black and lesbian feminists also in the indian context gayatri spivak had written in her can the subaltern speak the white man wants to rescue the brown woman from the brown man an example for post colonial feminism is hip hop feminism hip hop uh if you see hip hop it has traditionally history of being misogynist and it sexually objectifies and disrespects women ranging from the use of video vixen misogynist language and explicit rap rap lyrics doing anonymous works in graffiti to show that gender is neutral break dancing and hip hop music break dancing in particular you know in hip hop feminism it was actually called instead of break dancing it was also also called b boying b hyphen boying boying b o y i n g to show that uh, this is a uh, dance that is exclusive to men so they try to use of the same uh, features of hip hop feminism and try to sub subvert it and this kind of feminism it came into being with john morgan's book when chicken heads came to roost my life as a hip hop feminist for morgan hip hop feminist designates a contemporary feminist tense that engages with and it identifies all kinds of feminism that engages with ambiguity and difference and some poster girls of this uh, hip hop feminism are lil kim nikki minaj and uh, they also are known for their hyper stylized and theatrical performances neon colored wigs a series of racially and sexually diverse alter egos 
and for this nikki minaj had actually created you see she has she is dressed up as it is called harajuku babi harajuku babi and the criticism that has come against her is that this if when she creates this kind of a babi as a colored babi uh, she is actually again sub subscribing to a heterosexual subject but uh, this this has to be seen in a different light while uh, Britney Spears and Carrie Bradshaw were actually the icons of white post feminism. By by creating this kind of Barbie, she actually represented a fracturing of that ideal. And then we come to queer feminism. Okay, this particular movement. Um, I just uh, prepared this one in the morning. Uh, so it, I I am sure most of you are familiar familiar with Butler's Judith Butler's theory. how again just like uh, the binary the binary configuration of subject the binary configuration of gender itself is disrupted and you are aware of uh, butler's concept of performativity where she speaks of gender as not what one is but what one does and it is a uh, described as a series of stylized performances she gives that analogy of uh, going to a cupboard and selecting a dress okay you have a limited number of dresses in the cupboard and gender is just like that now you have male female and she says that if you had been given more options you would have chosen from those so now in the cupboard you have only male female or one or two transsexual or anything uh, you know all the different uh, variations so the thing is she says she brings us this analogy and she says all these are constructions and uh, it is a matter of choosing and it is what uh, what we do by a series of stylized uh, performances and she talks about the metaphysics of presence the body is taken and you inscribe meaning you put a long hair you put a long hair you uh, uh, that you walk in a certain way and then this is how gender is created and she says this kind of performativity where gender is uh, described through performance it can be both subversive and it can sorry uh, there's a spelling mistake here it can constrain also like we saw in the case of madonna it can she can subvert it also she can you can use this uh, kind of performance like we saw that madonna did in a uh, um, performance of material girl you can show that gender is actually a device and again it can be subversive also that is why we have this concept of drag you know they you, you have lady gaga particularly with her different male alter egos she imitates gender she has uh each time you find her dressed in a different kind of way and in imitating gender implicitly reveals the fact the imitation does and um, one example that was provided for us was the l word the drama the hollywood series that was actually criticized for its lipstick lesbianism in this particular this might not be true with all the movies that you find uh, queer queer movies that you find but in this particular movie uh, you know it was portrayed as two uh, two ladies uh, who who were full of makeup uh, they were seen to be, seen to embrace each other and again they were catering to the needs of the male gaze that is why this particular movie came in for criticism of course we have the latest fashionable cyber feminism now cyberspace uh, you know it offers a gender when you know you can you cannot even identify gender and sexual identities it can be questioned it can be problematized in a fluid form and it does not necessarily privilege a patriarchal form of femininity and female subjectivity this cyborg does not mount a report and it sorry i have written it does not it actually mounts a report to the cartesian subject it deconstructed it deconstructs its dual nature of the cartesian subject that verges on the mind body dichotomy that where the mind uh, corresponds to man and the body corresponds to the woman and it uh, deconstructs all kinds of worlds the world the difference between the uh, animal world and non animal world the difference between man and woman and also difference between the animal world and the uh, what is an inanimate world so it deconstructs all these uh, all these kinds of dialectical pairs eroding its inherent dualism and it is found that um, women also they have always been technologically othered i don't know somehow i, I have always asked uh, the have have uh, people thinking that uh, women even 
personally i had this experience or do you know this do you, some basic things that we are supposed to know and uh, it is this history of this technology's gendered bias towards men that jordana harvey rethinks in her 1985 article a manifesto for cyborgs and she also builds on this concept in her simian cyborgs and women and we always have this uh, idea that you know we hear all kinds of uh, huge names like jeff bezos um, mark zuckerberg charles babbage who created the first computer but what is not highlighted is that the first programmer was actually ada lovelace the spanning tree protocol that was necessary for network compu network computing was actually invented by radio pearl and a woman tcip transmission control internet protocol was actually invented by judith estre all these are relegated and um, elisa shevinsky lean out the struggle for gender equality in tech and startup culture this she actually writes this book if you have uh, we earlier encountered the book by sheryl stanberg saying lean in by uh, formulating such a title this is a direct challenge to um, uh, sheryl stanberg's book lean in and she says that she begins by saying that she quotes the controversial journalist david stretfield's new york times article where he says the internet was created by man she begins her book like that this myth is a blatant lie because if the first programmer was ada lovelace then we need not to say more and again in this age we find kind of even women in this age of technology also women are seen to be relegated you have female office assistants you have siri by default siri is a woman you have uh, uh, what was that uh, alexa you have cortana uh, this was a discussion i was having with my sister uh, this is actually her idea actually uh, professor zeenath of faru college and she was telling me even here there is a some kind of there is a master slave dialectic here also uh, where you tell the female office assistants hmm, siri do this alexa please put on that a uh, cortana microsoft amazon so alexa and um, apple's siri so all the you know even you see, the gender bias is very much there and why is it there because always assistants are women that they, in all these dialectical pairs you have the master slave dialectic assistants are women whether it is a nurse the first idea that comes to our mind is a woman uh, we have to say male nurse that itself shows the bias and then we say what is that secretaries secretaries are always women by default so this kind of uh, master slave dialectic is cyber world also and again you may ask are algorithms sexist definitely they are sexist because they can be sexist we find all kind of sexist memes coming up and how can an algorithm be? firstly it uh, depends on a success rate a success rate and uh, what was the second one i forgot uh, the idea of the number how many state so these depend on uh, and okay okay the third factor was a history it begins on the depends on these three factors a success rate how many times it is repeated plus the history and based on this we find certain memes being repeated again and again because uh, the success rate depends on how many again it depends on number how many times it is shared and then a history of it and sometimes the success rate also uh, sees which company or institution has produced it that again will be patriarchal and again uh, the success rate fails to see that most of these representations are by men and this is how algorithms also can be sexist okay so coming to that coming to the end uh, we have uh, we discussed in postmodern uh, feminism that the criticism was that a uh, woman comes under the tyranny of the signifier but how because uh the reader himself says there is no transcendental signified then uh if there, if there is no transcendental signifier then the signifier has no existence just like the gaps in between itself we have freud where he says that uh, women have penis envy and in the same breath he talks of castration anxiety he says that men are always have driven by this fear of castration anxiety and if that is the case women need not uh, that he, break, he you know he refutes his own logic women need not have penis envy because they are free of this castration anxiety 
and lacan says that uh, when you come when man comes, comes in access to which he loses access with reality and again he says language is equated with men and uh, the pre semiotic rea pre semiotic reality is equated with women so in spite of himself he himself says what is real the pre semiotic uh, maternal facts women and the, that is real and when a person comes into that of himself he says that male is unreal and woman is real and again we have find um, people making uh, parallel claims to the speech being equated with man and silence being on the same plane we have been saying mother tongue so with that i close my session today uh, with a quotation that maybe once woman was created once from the ribs of man but innumerable times after that he from her womb so thank you uh thank you very much ma'am it was such an engaging and deep paper so uh, it's time for a fruitful discussion do raise your questions comments and suggestions okay thank you okay thank you so, sir it's open for discussion now asha please lead it yeah please pre feel free to raise your questions i think janaki ma'am ma'am i kick start the discussion uh, no umar it's not necessary that you are the you are the right person that's why i'm saying especially when it comes to you know like this the great executive and also is here just a minute uh, rukia thank you for that very exhaustive uh, presentation i think it has been a while since we had such a lengthy such a comprehensive and uh, you know exhaustive presentation uh, actually you i think you covered the entire spectrum of uh, more or less the one uh, western feminism Uh, the different uh, layers and different dimensions up to now, but I just wondered why you didn't touch upon. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. I okay. can hear you, ma'am. Yeah, all right. Is it just for the? I, I. This itself took such a long time. Is it because of the paucity of time that you didn't touch upon the other uh, aspects? You know, which really uh, I think fundamentally question the very premises of white feminism. Uh, market feminism capitalist feminism uh, which comes from the people like the black women writers you did mention bellow uh, briefly i remember that um, but at the same time some fundamental questions have been raised by uh, many of them to the extent that they even uh, decided to give off i mean you know, give up the uh, very term feminism uh I, you know who i am referring to it was alice walker who suggested that let us be let us have the term womanism and not feminism so i find uh, uh, you know very often when we discuss uh, we do not uh, take very seriously the very very um, you know, what do i say very critical voices who have questioned the fundamentals of the whole uh, uh, feminist uh, thought uh, particularly the western white western feminist thought So I was just wondering: Is it so? Maybe I can, I can surely understand that it took such a long time. Is that the reason why you decided to keep that away, or, or for instance, the Dalit feminist movement? Because when we were talking about women, their oppression, etc., I can't just forget the uh, what has what is what is actually um, you know what is actually taken India or Indian women by storm since yesterday's the the um, the rape and. Murder of the Dalit girl uh, uh, from UP in uh, in uh, in Delhi. I mean, she died in a hospital in Delhi, and uh, I mean, uh, we cannot get away from that. You know, the kind of uh, though there is a commonality of oppression everywhere. I happen to hear 
uh, a very interesting uh, comment by in the news uh, debate yesterday on NPTV. I forget the lady's name. She has written a book. Actually, I mean, she's a new author, so I'm not able to remember the name. But her new book has apparently come out, and it's called Why Men Rape. You know, and so she was saying, just as we think oppression is intersectional, we have to start about thinking about privilege also being intersectional. Privilege is also intersectional. People who are in power, that power is also intersectional. So she made a very interesting point there. So, so there are so many things, so many doubts that arise within me. I mean, these are not, these are certain random thoughts that came to my mind. I can't call them questions. As I was listening to you, I was thinking, about also the feminist vigilantism, you know, when we to refer to Vijay P. Nair's, uh, uh, how he was uh, woman handled, I would say woman handled, not man handled, woman handled by the three women, uh, apparently. I use uh, it in a subversive uh, name. Pardon, Asha? Did you, uh, I, used, it I used it in a subversive way. No, yeah, no, yeah, I, I, was understand. Actually... I understand. I, I quite, uh, I'm totally in the, the spirit of your uh, position. So that, that, that's why I said woman handle. So woman can also handle, but it is also a kind of a vigilantism, uh, which uh, I'm not really uh, very comfortable with, you know, which, uh, because anybody can use this. Anybody can use that. They, uh, there's a, see, uh, this is what I wanted to point out, uh, like for instance, even about the Me Too campaign, there have been critical voices from within feminism itself. And I think our uh, understanding and our approach will not be complete without factoring in that, those, that criticism also. Uh, I think it's time that we started talking about that too. Uh, this is my humble uh, submission. Uh, not, I mean, I understand the kind of frustration and desperation from which such acts emerge. But there is also a, a, another side to it, which can be dangerous to women themselves very often. You know, it can be self-defeating sometimes. That also needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, it, it, it may not sound very, uh, very uh, celebratory, but I am not in a very celebratory mood right now because I feel things are too complex and too dangerous and too much against women, staked against women. So we need to move very cautiously here. It's very important. Because when we, I do, somehow I see when we circumvent the due process, and go head on, then we are also, uh, doesn't it become undemocratic in some way? This is a question that I want everyone, all of us to think uh, together, you know, uh, are we also talking about the you know, same kind of vigilantism, uh, which we often see in superstar films, and we critique, and we critique. You know, we critique people like uh, the superstar images that have been uh, sold by people like Amitabh Bachchan or Rajini Khan or whoever, who, who they come in the dead, dead of, like people like Shahin Shah, they come in the dead of the night and it's a vigilantism. That, that vigilantism being uh, re, uh, uh, reprised by the, the feminist idols, how much, how salutary can that effect be? I'm not very really sure about that. I mean, uh, and I also remembered, I think you made a very important point about corporate feminism and that particular book, Lean In, uh, because there is a lady called Nancy Fraser who doesn't figure in our discussions ever. She's the first person to take this capitalist feminism to task. And she was saying whatever the feminist movement started, uh, started uh, criticizing in the beginning, that very object of criticism appropriated feminism which is capitalism. So uh, these are just random thoughts that struck me. Uh, I, I feel it's high time we started talking about the conflicts within the whole monolith also. And I also wondered why you didn't talk about uh, feminist uh, thought and movements from this side of the world. Is it just positive of time? I come back to the original question. I'm sorry if I took up so, too much of time, but your paper was so rich. It made me think in so many lines. That's why I wanted to say all these things. Thank you, Rukia. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. And thank you so much for invaluable output. It was quite thought provoking. And uh, I agree with you that uh, some people may misuse this. But when uh, if you look at it, uh, you know, these ladies have also made use of such, I think, of such uh, an extreme step out of sheer desperation. Because, you know, uh, they probably they have tried all the means in their hand. And our cyber laws also are so weak. 
but then as you said yeah maybe tomorrow somebody if you uh, if too much too many people may upload it there there is a possibility of people misusing it also but then the i think but you know the but i think uh, how many how, how many women this is the first time a woman has taken step at least men will be a bit more careful uh, it is taken for granted normally especially on the cyber world it is taken for granted that uh, women women can be trolled uh, mercilessly they can be witch hunted we know about the recent uh, death of sushant singh rajput uh, the difference is that when jia khan suicided she had left her suicide note saying that uh, her boyfriend was responsible for the death and still that particular person is roaming around free but when in the when it comes to a man uh, his uh, girlfriend is you know mercilessly she is witch hunted first the claim was he, and he has not mentioned anyway that she is with him first the claim was that she had siphoned off funds that was proved to be false and then it was abetment to suicide and then it was homicide and then it was that she forced him to take drugs now that has also been proved to be false now what next so that is a you know the, when it is a woman on the other side it takes a different kind of narrative and as you said i i, I myself when i was creating this presentation i i was aware that i was not making use of indian indian categories or so indian big because that is of the paucity because of the paucity of time because uh, i have a class the next hour also ma'am and i thought you know but uh, i thought okay now i have brought, i'll restrict myself to western uh, uh, post feminism but you know even while making that presentation i was having an guilty feeling that okay i'm not referring to these that's why i came up with some indian examples of the movies i was very much aware of that and i was very much aware also of the fact that uh, even our the way our syllabus is uh, created the way our universities are conditioned i think the uh, universities universities can start uh, our all our theories all our all our theories not only feminist theories everything is western uh most of the okay at least now there's some kind of change but i think most of them we need to uh, formulate our own categories our own theories and uh, that can make a lot of difference and uh, that is why i did not i, I have focused only on your particular uh, what do you say uh on particular categories of western feminism that is why i've only referred to that because i had testing yeah i thought i perfectly yeah <laughs> Yeah, I perfectly understand, Rukhia. It was not. And I so perfectly agree with you, ma'am. Agree with you, ma'am, because those those are also uh, pertinent questions and pertinent points that we need to raise. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, thank you, Rukhia. Anything? Anybody else? Anything else? Any question? Uh, hi, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, Neetu, I can hear you. Ah, uh, uh, hi, ma'am. My name is Neetu Oli, and I have a question. Ah, uh, recently, especially in Kerala, with the Vijay Nair case, the feminists have been ah uh, have been accused of being selectively responsive. And uh, is it ah uh, uh, myself? Ah, uh, I think I'm a fem. I am a feminist, but still, I still find myself to be selectively responsive in some cases. So. often in asking myself is it because i'm a hypocrite or is it because feminism can't help but be selectively responsive what, uh, what are your thoughts on it neetu that very much de de depends on the kind of person we are i that you know that better than me but yes there is a kind of hypocrisy and yesterday i had a, a read a status by priya ma'am priya k naya who said that even women can be capable of toxic masculinity there are cases but on a larger perspective but you cannot uh, uh, you know every person every person has a different uh, story to tell every person struggle is different uh, th there is probably you know bhagya lakshmi her struggle is different that is why she had to finally resort to such a drastic step so you know each story is different we cannot view everything with the same perspective and uh, selective feminism uh, recently you may be aware of uh, pile goshes uh, allegations against anurag basu also and um, side most of the anurag kashyap anurag kashyap look here is it anurag, anurag kashyap you are talking about yes sir yes I, the director no ma'am yeah yeah it's anurag kashyap sir kashyap sorry yeah yeah anurag kashyap and uh, 
many people are on his side actually saying that he would he was a staunch feminist and many people so they also you know you find you on one side maybe that lay and as janagi ma'am said you know when one woman falsely accuses it actually you know it uh, it actually puts a question mark of all those who are you know uh, putting it in, putting in a legitimate struggle so we don't know perhaps what she's saying is true perhaps what she's saying is false but that is the danger of it when someone takes a negative step we are also speaking on behalf of all feminists uh, and uh, i said there are many people who calls feminism fox feminism fox feminism and uh, you you have more people you know you know you are just uh, uh, you are just adding up to this so uh, so it's up to us uh, up to different people on whether you want to practice selective feminism suppose you don't know sometimes a man may be innocent also in this case but then you are also you know your 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 uh, uh, what do you say your your making uh, it different for very much difficult for all your sisters who have who are facing similar struggles so i don't know whether you call that an a selective feminism feminism uh, ladies you know I, there is selective feminism there are people who practice selective feminism there are ladies which are hetero patriarchal attitude like for example in the dowry system also there are more than the sun citizen mothers who uh, actually demand the dowry in some cases i am talking i was actually talking about the reification part men are objectified in such systems but actually the driving force you see in such cases also you know uh, these ladies are adding to this patriarchal system so and uh, this is my point of view selective feminism it depends on the person and the and her uh, and the issue at hand like right? so in the case of anurag kashyap's case he may be a uh, genuine he may be not at fault in that case if i support him will it be called selective feminism i don't think so if he is in the right but but i don't know uh, it again it depends on the situation it depends upon the person okay ma'am thank you yeah. uh rukia can i add to that a little Please, what need to ask is a very Please. interesting question what need to ask yeah uh, thank you what need to ask is a very interesting question and what i would like to tell her and everybody who has to i think even i have these doubts very often what exactly where do we stand see which is a feminism is a spectrum it is not a monolith you cannot always be at one point you know because it's also constantly evolving and the questions are changing it's a situated feminism and uh, just because you don't stand in one side feminists are divided but they don't fall it's not that all stand and fight that's it so there are divisions and there's nothing to be embarrassed about feminists being divided over issues so you need to don't feel bad it's the way you are evolving as, as an individual and as a feminist so it's not as and there are people who they went very strong independent minded women who completely debunked feminism there are also people like that so don't be don't be embarrassed don't don't feel inhibited about your doubts just go ahead and explore yourself that's more like it be genuine that's much more important okay ma'am you know, that is that's all yeah okay thank okay. you yes ma'am thank you yes. thank you for adding to it ma'am as uh, ma'am said it is always important to be self reflexive and self critical it helps us grow uh if we look in words would you had such a kind of thought hello hello Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Omar, and uh, it is a wonderful yes, presentation. Sir. I feel like patting myself because you know, uh, I was instrumental in inviting you in a way. Thank you, sir. Okay, and uh, the thing is, I did know it was uh, really wonderful. And uh, when you started, things uh, about uh, asking the question who was created first, the men or women? I read somewhere, you know, it's sort of a joke because uh, when God. God first created men, realized that it was a mistake, and then He created women. It's a kind of kind of a joke, okay? So then you refer to the slave master-slave dialectic, is the Hegelian dialectic. Uh, as you know, this dialectic is basically dying. It's uh, the master always feels unsafe, and uh, it's so precarious. It so happens that the 
you know, the balance of power might tilt in the slave's favor at any time. But in the history of, you know, patriarchy or in the history of, in the human history, what we see is that patriarchy has, uh, or at least is showing signs of, you know, uh, being eroded. I Means, for example, there was a book, uh, it was published something like in the 80s. It was about, um, you know, remaking man by David Gittes. And I have read in so many other places, patriarchy is, its grip is weakening. And uh, following the Abu Ghraib incident, uh, which uh, was widely publicized, it was said that, you know, patriarchy has lost its final, you know, the final coffin on the nail of patriarchy has already been hammered. Such things were said. But despite that, the tenacity of uh, masculinity or patriarchy seems to be, you know, as evil as vicious as it is. So how do you read it from the Hegelian perspective of the weak, I mean, I mean the inherently weak uh, grasp or grip that patriarchy or the master has on the slave? And uh, how, uh, what, I mean, for example, the recent events, how, to what extent can we read it to be a sign of, a very good sign of patriarchy, patriarchy's uh, grip weakening or loosening? Yeah, I just, I, I just want you to take on this. So, uh, in a way, uh, when you speak of the master-slave dialectic, it is the you know it is the image of the slave that helps to build the master, and you know the master is nothing without the slave. So, in this case also, you know, as just like the uh, reader also has said uh, that you know sometimes uh, the in the, in the also in the context of Orientalism, Orientalism, the margin of the East helps define the center of the West. So I think that is a in the, that happens also in the case of this master-slave dialectic. The, the the margin of the slave helps build the center of the master, and it is this uh, the weakness, the all the things that uh, women are like, um, you know synonymous with uh, weakness, passivity as i said lack of intelligence all this helped to build the other called the man and i think he, they particularly make use of this kind of dialectic uh, dialectic this kind of dichotomy this kind of dialectical pair to build you know it is it is it is actually um, like the mirror stage you know it helps to build oneself in this case the weak actually try helps to build what you know by by attributing women with all the opposites of what they are it abs it actually helps to build the male ego in this case also in the recent case of vijay p nair also probably he has uh, he, he cannot blame any pro probably he's probably by uh, what do you say um, marketing on the on his supposed idea of feminism and the weakness or any kind of trolling he was actually trying to boost his own male ego and uh, build himself through his youtube videos uh, to an audience that would cater cater to these kind of rubbish and he was trying to bolster his uh, kind of male ego and that kind of you know you can find that kind of dialectic in these kind of uh, and also you know there's a kind of uh, sect when when a woman you know she's constantly there is a as a janagi mom has said there's some kind of vigilantism and there is kind of moral policing and uh, all this you even on the cyberspace you can find this you know this kind of dialectic happening and you know women are shown down it is only to bolster their ego so that that functions the opposite functions the weak showing them as the weak as passive it actually helps construct the male ego that is my understanding and i understand that how it works in the current world also so i um, have to think a while for more examples That is how I think it generally works. Well, thank you. It's, it, it, it was a very good reply. And through your presentation, you have uh, uh, disproven what your, some of the teachers, some of your professors said that women cannot think in a very structured way. Yours was very structured, much better than thank most you. of us can do. It was very structured. It was a great presentation. A lot of you know, congratulations for that. Thank you so much, sir. Any more questions? Yeah, as uh, Dr. Janaki said, it was a very rich presentation. I suppose uh, there would be more questions. You can use the chat box too.
Okay, if there are no more questions. Yeah, if there are no more questions, uh, we'll wind up the session. Asha? Because I've, I've got a class the next hour. Yeah, but yeah. I know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rukia. Yes. Beautiful. Yes. Really enjoyed it immensely. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, ma Thank you for your insightful responses, ma'am. Thank you. It was a pleasure listening to you. So, ma'am, yeah. ma shall we wind up then? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, Rukhya ma'am. It was a quite interesting session. And as Janvi ma'am has already pointed out, um, it has been quite some time since we have in our department, we have had such a long, exhaustive, engaging, broad uh, presentation. So thank you for your time, ma'am. I, ma I, for... I thought Sorry? it was short. <laughs> I thought I'd uh, oh, no. uh, end it briefly. <laughs> yeah. Not That's short at all. Not short at all. Because uh, I had a class the next hour, it was scheduled at 11.45, uh, so I was going very fast, and I'm sorry for my speed. Oh, oh so you are late for the class. Oh, yeah. She has a class at 11.45. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, ma'am, then. Uh, so thank you for being with us, and thank you for your quite enlightening paper. We could have listened to you for more time. Yeah, so... Thank you very much. Thank you, teachers, scholars, and students for your patient listening and for your active participation. So we shall meet again next week. Until then, see you all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, thank you, Asha and Umma, sir, for the invitation. I really enjoyed myself. <laughs>